especially like to thank uh, Plaza Athene as well as Bobby Chia for bringing together so many different opinions and ideas so that we can have discussions and debates rather than arguments. I'm really not into confrontation and arguments. I would also like to take doc, uh, thank Dr. Niti Mohananda for giving me the time so that I can come and actually present and be part of such great things that I've seen already. We're at the Plaza Athene, and he may have already told you that my, my focus is more in information, energetics, regenerative therapy. And if we actually think of the term information, here we are at Plaza Athene, which really speaks of Athens. Athens was the place in Greece where we fought, saw the first inkling of democracy. And this was the first place where we saw people vote, not so much on the people they were voting for, but the ideas, the legislations, the laws, if they worked. And we decided as a group to bring those things together when we knew that they would work. And information is so very important. And this brings me to actually a story of Greek mythology that Dr. Koliakos uh, pointed out to me last night. He said, did you ever hear the story of Eos and Tithonus? And I said, no. He said, well, this is a very famous story of this goddess Eos who was daughter of Zeus. And she came to the planet Earth where the mortals were, and she noticed this very beautiful young man from Sparta. This beautiful young man, she wanted to be with him for the rest of her existence. So she went back to Zeus and she said, I would love to be with Tithonos and I want him to be immortal. And Zeus said, fine, he will be immortal. But as time went on, they noticed that Tithonos was immortal, but the only problem was that she didn't ask the question, the information properly. He could live forever, but he was going to age and deteriorate. So the question is, if if Zeus has a very good, difficult time holding back time, how is it that we will learn methods for holding back time, but we must, we must get used to the idea that there will be time, there will be aging, but it's a method of how do we age gracefully? How do we find the biomarkers for aging, the biomarkers for anti-aging, and then use certain therapies, specifically I will focus on stem cell therapies, and use them in practice in order to see that we are getting markers, we are getting changes, and how do we apply that? I will specifically go through certain things, uh, procedure overview of the anti-aging fat stem cell therapy. You've seen this already. I'm going to go through it much more quickly. In addition to that, patient case studies. And we're looking at homing of activated cells. And Dr. Holt, as well as Dr. Paspaliaris, bring up this very important point, that there are mediators. These things are messengers. And this boils down to information again. And I will point out one very specific thing. This hotel could not have been built without information. I could not be a doctor without information. We would not be able to do work in stem cell therapy without it. We would not be able to be mechanics that build cars without it. Information becomes a very central key in almost everything we do. We may discover in the future that much of disease is information based and that our treatments if we could imagine, are ways of adding new information to the body so that this way we can upgrade immune systems and cause the body's immune system functions, its platform for function to integrate so we get a much more profound effect by providing the right information. Also, we want to look at wellness and anti-aging testing programs and how is it that we can apply those wellness or anti-aging testing programs to stem cell therapy. Well, of course, Dr. Pasapaliaris went through this. There are many different areas from which we can get stem cells, bone marrow, there's blood, we can get them from fat, we can get them embryonically. And what we love about them so much is that they are a new blank slate, a tabula rasa, an open blackboard upon which we can now write in new information to create cells in many different parts of the body. So we have a generalized platform from which to move so that we can focus and regenerate. And this is very, very powerful because if we're really to look, if we're really to look, we might notice on the planet now that we have to get a patient to a certain level even before they start to heal. It is almost as though if there isn't enough organ reserve, the person will stay in a state of survival, but we hardly will see the body move towards a state of thriving. And the object would be to regenerate the body to a point so that now we can move them much more and in a much more accentuated manner towards healing. In using fat-derived stem cells autologously, there are certain risk factors which are removed. This is decreased doctor risks because now there's a less likely chance that we're going to get rejection, a less likely chance that we're going to get side effects. 
We have no immunity rejection. There are some things that we can see when we give them intravenously that maybe the person shivers a little bit, but we've never seen a complete rejection. Um, in this simple procedure, that it is easy, quick, cost-effective, these are the things that we do want to see in medicine with the incredible burgeoning uh, bills that we see. In fact, in the United States of America, we will need $1 trillion U.S. to begin to even give standardized universal health care. I'll go through the procedure quickly. We do a mini liposuction, harvest the fat. We take the fat, we add an enzyme to it to emulsify it. We almost want to turn it into a soupy mixture. The stem cells come to the bottom, we centrifuge them. And then we take those stem cells, we add the PRP, because if you could think of these stem cells as though they're baby cells, the platelet-rich plasma contains the food for the baby cells. This way we can add them to the medium and we'll actually feed the cells and create the surrounding for the cells so that they feel comfort, nurtured, so that they can grow. And important for our technique is that we want to take these cells and put them back into the body as quickly as possible. We very hardly see a mother separate from child. We always see the mother close to the child. We want to make sure we stay in step with the cycles of nature and the healing process and not pull these cells out for incubation for long periods of time, although that can be beneficial. We know that over that period of time, we will definitely see that the body has changed. Cortisol levels may go up. A person may take a new substance or a supplement. There may be many changes they can be exposed to. So if we can stay in the cycle and very quickly get these back to the patient, we can see that our results are a lot more fulminant. And then we can give these after activating under the light, we can give them by intravenous drip. And to prove again, there is lots of research to show that when we give the right spectrum and frequency of LED light, this does awaken the cells. So we went through this before. If you're to see, we had to actually, this is proprietary information, which we actually had to figure out what are the frequencies of light that work? What is going to give us maximum activation? We always particularly see in these three frequencies of green, yellow, and red with a great emphasis on green. And of course, I'm a doctor who uses analogies because I believe in information, but we live on a planet that is green. It makes sense to me that the light that comes from something that is green might create a greater growth response. More information that laser uh, LED light activation actually uh, moves store, uh, store, uh, cells from dormant to activated. And how do we know that they are activated? Because when a cell becomes activated, we see the release of something as a marker which proves that activation is happening, basal endothelial growth factor. And what we definitely see with this procedure is that in many cases when we use this light source and use this technique, we're producing much more basal endothelial growth factor than can be produced by the common incubating methods. And this basal endothelial growth factor is central because we want blood supply going to the tissue, the fat, the organs, because without oxygen, without blood supply, we cannot get the nutrients for healing. But to look at it in terms of the anti-aging process, we see that over a period of time, we have stem cells that are available in the blood for healing. As a child, we can have up to 80 million stem cells floating around being ready at any given time to be called for healing. But as soon as we move in age towards midlife, we get to around the age of 40, we begin to see these stem cell numbers that are available to do the work drop rapidly or drop into a range in which now we have half the army needed to do the resultant work. So it might take longer to heal. In fact, we can see children become exposed to a cough or a condition every three months. They get something, it goes away. Then there's a new thing, they get it, it goes away. They can rapidly cause this combination effect of causing healing, turning over cells. By giving our stem cell therapy, what we do is we give a large number of cells for a period of time. It is almost like we're pulling back the clock. I would not say that I believe stem cells are a fountain of youth, but if we could find a way to actually get to the point at which we can have a larger number of cells available so that we can do the healing, this would be of great benefit, especially in anti-aging. How do the stem cells know where to go? And this is an information technique. I sometimes know where to go in my office because the ladies in the office will leave me a sticky note when they leave the office. We're downstairs having lunch. Come talk to us. And this little message gives me an idea of where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do. If we have these messengers inside the body, these messengers are ways in which cells actually can communicate with each other. We get along much better as human beings when we have clear communication. I would say that probably the greatest amount of our focus should be in how do cells talk to each other? What are they saying? If we can get a handle on this information, it would be sort of like we figured out the combination to a lock. We step into a whole new area, get a greater level of healing that we may have ever seen before. And I would say that we have, we have geniuses working with us, like Dr. Nicholas Ede, 
who I would say is a peptide expert, probably a peptide king, and Dr. Pasapaliaris, who focuses specifically on this area of looking at these specific mediators of language. Because there's one thing I've definitely learned, and I'll probably come to this a little bit later, but living in Thailand, and I see this beautiful stem cell across the room, a Thai woman, I walk up to her and I say hello, and one of the first things she says to me is, you speak Thai? And I look at her, and I say, the only Thai word I know I learned from a tuk-tuk driver. I go, oi, just like that. Because if I cannot communicate with her, how can I have a relationship? How will I know her? How would we grow together? This mechanism of communication is central to everything. Information. Information is so powerful that the number one company on the stock market is Google. What do they do? They move information. So we see that when there's damage to tissue, there are cytokines or chemokines which are released from the tissue. These are flags or markers or messengers of information. This brings the stem cells into the area. As we see the stem cells come into the area, they're attracted to the area, and then we start to see this healing effect or regrowth effect start to take place in the tissue. Now, here's a very important point. We keep hearing the idea that stem cells are converting into something, but we're, we don't know that stem cells are actually creating new tissue. It is more as though stem cells are like directors that might be releasing the information so that the cells that may be present, progenitor cells, that can regrow individual tissue are now signaled by a director in order to make that tissue grow. That looking at it as though there is still a signaling process, still a communication process, is very, very important. Chemokines or cytokines and growth factors in the language of the gods. Remember that EOS asked for immortality for the man that she loved, but she did not ask for him to have youth. And this missing piece of information, since it was not added to the equation, did not result in what she actually wanted. So as we look more in this area, we should look in the direction of saying, these are growth factors. And there was another list that Dr. Pasapaliaris put up in which we saw all of these peptides and factors. We know that they're in combinations. What combinations? How many of them? How do we know the concentration's correct? Maybe there's a signaling mechanism for each person that has a different combination. So more likely, the idea that the stem cells actually come into the area and the enhancement of growth through cell-to-cell -cell contact and mitochondrial exchange may also be a role. That somehow information is being passed between cells in order to activate cells into action. That this particular idea might be a very central focus we could look at. There is a library of information. I consider Dr. Pasapaliaris and Dr. E. Deep Sea Divers of the bloodstream, of cellular mechanism. We go down into the deepest of the ocean, we discover a new piece of coral or a new fish. And we've never seen this, but we've been on this planet for a very long period of time. Now these guys are going down there and starting to figure out what is actually happening down here. Let's categorize these things, find out what's going on, test it, see whether or not it is working properly, how it does work, how they communicate, where do the stem cells go. We can see that when we look at where the percentage of stem cells go and we add them intravenously to the body, that there are specific organs that are targeted, specifically lungs come up very high. And if we think about this really, the lungs are very centrally important to anti-aging and to healing as well. Because without oxygen, you would not live for more than five minutes. So these lungs are constantly being used and constantly turning over cells and constantly being exposed to things in the environment that they can have reactions to. So the idea that stem cells would go here in order to repair this tissue makes a lot of sense to me. And then we see that the liver is also involved, and this is areas in which the body is definitely turning over cells. And the spleen's job is to break down red blood cells, become a graveyard for red blood cells. So it makes sense that this organ would be working very rapidly, creating inflammatory cytokines that could draw more stem cells to the area. This slide you've seen before, if we do not activate the stem cells, we can definitely tag them and know that they've gone.